Okay. So you are welcome, Uzim Emmanuel. Um, uh, this is a webinar for the Standard African Bank Chairman Scholarship, and um, this is our host, this is our guest, Uzim Emmanuel. Please, at FON, um, just a brief introduction. At FON, we are passionate about making a um, scholarship packs with different scholars from Nigeria and other African countries. The idea is to give you a first-hand information from our scholars. You can ask him questions, jot down your questions, and just bombard him with your questions. Feel free, please. It's a free word, and this, this entire system is for you. So welcome, everyone, again. I OK. So Uzim, over to you. All right. Uh... Zim, yeah, I can hear you. Thank you so much, Chisom. Uh, all right, so we have Ibukun and Abba here on the call. I'm hoping others will be able to join shortly, but nevertheless, I will just fire down. So thank you so much, Chisom, for having me um, join this call, most especially to FON as well. So practically, I'm going to just share my story around um, me and me being in Oxford entirely. So I will start by just letting everybody know that for a start, I'm just like everyone else. So there is no like distinguishing factor that makes me any different. As you can see, I just have one head and we are all in this together. So entirely, my name is Emmanuel Uzim. I finished from the Federal University of Technology Uwari with a first class in electrical and electrical engineering. So that was in the year 2018. And after that, I proceeded to like have some professional career experience while working. So I worked with some engineering companies and energy companies entirely in Lagos. And then in the course of that whole period, I saw the need to try to further more studies with respect to my board joining career. So I decided to say, okay, this is who I am. I've really had like a good experience working around the engineering space and also trying to see how I can sustainably see transition happen in the energy space in Nigeria. So with that, that entailed me to look for a university that was doing something of that nature. And it turned out I had to do like a series of research. So I looked for universities across the globe. There's, in fact, when I hear people talking, telling their stories of how they started and how they gone through 1001 applications. I think I'm one of those people on the list. If I don't make it, maybe I'm among the top 10%. So yes, that was my case study. So I literally was looking for opportunities. I started by looking for schools in the US. And of course, yes, I did apply. I got some opportunities and also even in the UK as well. But particularly some of them didn't come with funding. So it had like a huge like, um, will I say deterrent for me? But nevertheless, I saw it as the possibility that yes, there's something that I could actually do differently that could probably earn me what I needed. So while all of that was happening, I still had my career there. So I kept on like putting in the whole energy into trying to see that I can be able to get all the necessary knowledge I need to get. So even if I'm not getting it in the classroom, I can actually get it on the field. And it's interesting to see how progressive the Nigerian um, industrial space is. So I took advantage of that. So trickling down to 2021, I then decided to take a very, very huge decision. And that was me telling myself that rather than taking the opportunity to be applying to several schools, I'm going to apply to three strategic schools of which I'm going to give it my best shot and also look forward to seeing that I got through the whole application with a successful admission. And so that was how I started. So first thing I did was to find a school that was doing something related to what I was actually practicing as an engineer. So that revolved me looking for schools. I went for three, one in the US, one in Canada, and then one in UK without any particular preference. So it's not like I wanted to like do it one in each country, but I think those schools were the ones that stood out for me because they were offering something with respect to um, data analytics and how it's interrelates or correlates with the energy transitioning. So I did apply to the schools and then I 
made sure that I had all my required documents available. So most of them, as usual, would expect you to have your statement of purpose, or which will probably like a um, what exactly entails you to you applying to the schools. Um, others will ask for your transcript, um, your degree certificate. Some might also require you to provide a, an English requirement test. And so all of this, I, within the course of the last few years, I tried to like have all of them at hand. So that was particularly some of the things I needed to make sure that I had so that I won't have any difficulty saying, oh, I missed a deadline while applying. So you can see the reason why I took that strategic decision to say, okay, I think these are the three schools I'm applying for. These are the requirements and I'm sure I do have everything. So I applied to the three and because we're looking at Oxford, Oxford is like the main one that I totally would say that I give a good shot at. But interestingly, when I was applying to Oxford, I think I'll just be sincere with you guys. I felt like Oxford wasn't ideally the number one school in my mind. I felt like, ah, I've not, I, I hardly see people go into Oxford. I, heard, I hardly hear Africans that made it into Oxford. And if you actually made it into Oxford, then it means you're an outlier. And so I felt, okay, maybe if I'm going to be giving it a shot, don't put your hope there so that you will not get to cry so much. So put it in other schools. And so I submitted my applications. I tried as much as possible to be very sincere about myself, tell my story truthfully, and also show how much important that Oxford is going to be to me actualizing my dreams. And this I was made to do in less in 500 words or less. So it's interesting to see that other universities will ask you to write a stable purpose and they will not even require you, to, they won't even give you like a stipulated word length. But here was Oxford not telling me 1,000, not telling me 2,000, but telling me 500, which is like averagely a page or even less. So how do you tell your story in just 500 words? And that is what Oxford was looking out for, particularly my own program. So that was the first um, challenge that I saw as a good opportunity for me to tell my story. So maybe before I've been saying a lot and perhaps it's not, I'm not hitting the point, but maybe I could do it in 500 words and be able to hit the point succinctly. So I took that step and did my essay had good friends of mine who helped to review it and then submitted my application. Misha also provided all my required documentation in that regard. And so after that, the next thing I got was um, an invite. So I was told that, oh, Emmanuel, your application was received successfully and you can now progress to the next. And I was like, okay, is this really happening? I was expecting maybe also would be like the first love letter I would get. Why? Why am I seeing this? So in a way I was like, okay, this is a good news in the good direction, in the right direction. So yeah, the next step now required me to prepare myself for an interview. And now this is like the first time I'm finding myself in a situation where I'm applying to a school and then they are requiring me to do a proper interview, not for a PhD program, you should take note of that. So I wasn't applying for a PhD. If it was a PhD, I would have said fair enough, at least the professor wants to get to know me. But this was like a master's program, which is just one year. But still yet, you were required to do a, um, an interview. So I was like, good. So yes, I then felt like it was the good time to take the bull by the horn, and then I prepared myself. So for the interview, um, can you all hear me? Please confirm if you can hear me, please. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. On my end, I can hear you. Okay, beautiful. I think we've lost Ibuku. Um, how do we do this? All right, so I think she'll be able to join in, hopefully. So, but, um, Esther, you could try to see if there's a way you can help her in case. She... Uzim, are you with us? Hello, Uzim.
Manuel, are you with us? We lost you. We lost you for a moment. Are you with us? Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm with you now. Can you hear me, all, please? Yes, we can hear you now. Great. Um, sorry about that. So where was I, please? If you can still remind me. So I, I don't feel like I've jumped the gun. Talking about your interview now. All right. Interview. All right. Thank you. Just wanted to be sure that we're on the same page so in case you lost me before now. So yes, on the interview, so I was given a topic to talk around and my topic was around electrification of transport systems. So that came in as a new topic to me because it's not something that pertains to the African space, but at the same time, it was something that was also novel and I'd also started getting my hands on it. So I just had to like do my research and then I worked on the presentation, put it in a, power, a PowerPoint slide, and then waited for the day to present. So take note that I also took my time to make sure that I prepared adequately for it. So it wasn't just a shabby presentation, but I made sure that I attach every form of um, excellence in it to make sure that yes, you, I, they know that it's a quality candidate that they're actually looking out for. And I'm also presenting myself in that way. So the interview happened and then we, I had like a seven minutes interview, like I said, and then two minutes to respond to any questions that they had for me. And also they also listening to know if I have any questions for them. And so I had that presentation and follow up to was that, okay, they were going to get back to me. And I had my fingers crossed. After that interview, I think after some few weeks, I then got a mail that said I had gotten admitted into Oxford. So that was now the first shocker. I'm like, okay, I just had an interview. What's going on here? All of a sudden I have, I'm getting, I'm admitted into Oxford. This is like the number one university in the world. And I've literally like had every intuition that is going to be difficult to get in. But this was just me who just applied, give it my best shot. And then I just got admitted. So seeing the admission came as a very big news for me and I was so excited. And then the next thing was getting funding. So Oxford in its own uniqueness says that if you get admitted into Oxford, there's a high likelihood that you get a funding. And that is outrightly put on their website. So if you're going to be applying for a course, always do well to look out for opportunities for your course. So some of them might come with external funding, while some actually come from internal, internal funding from either your department or your college, or even from the university itself. So there's always an opportunity for you. All you just have to do is try to see if it applies to your, um, let's like say your, your demography or if it applies to your person. So for me, there were several scholarships that were there. There was the Wooden Food Hoffman, there was the Rhodes Scholarship. But those for the Rhodes Scholarship, I think I had missed it narrowly because of my age bracket. And then for the Wooden Food Hoffman, I got to apply to it. So while I was submitting my application for Oxford, I also had the opportunity to submit my application for Wooden Food Hoffman as well. But then there were still other ones that if you qualify for it, the school itself will recommend it. You probably don't even need to apply. Your application is sufficient enough. As long as you can get an admission, they follow up with a mail telling you you qualified for the scholarship and you're, you're happy to welcome you to resume at the school. So for my own case, because I am coming from Nigeria, particularly Africa, so there was a scholarship which was pertinently meant for African students in trying to see how they can be able to welcome more African diversity in Oxford because currently Oxford has like, let's say an average of 3% and growing of African people in the university. So that shows that the whole demography for Africans in the school is still very low and there's a very high need that we need to like increase that. So there comes the place where the African Oxford initiatives comes around. And so they try to see how best they can be able to provide opportunities for students to be able to apply to Oxford. So getting a mail from the University of Oxford and saying that there was a scholarship and we feel that you're best qualified to apply for this, please give it a shot. I knew that that was one opportunity I didn't want to take for granted. And so I looked up more about the scholarship. So because it's a very competitive scholarship, imagine you opening a scholarship to 
almost every African student that has gotten admitted to the university. And then you just have like very few slots. So I knew at the back of my mind that it was going to be very competitive. So I needed to also give it my best shot as well. Everyone who was applying for it was an exceptional candidate, that's for sure. But at the same time, you need to prove to the committee why you are the best choice for the scholarship. So yeah, then I had to go back to the drawing board and then have a reflection upon myself and find out what actually makes me unique. What makes me stand out from others, even in this my little niche? And so that falls back to being sincere and saying the real truth about yourself, being also very visionary that you can be able to tell that this is what I've been able to do. This is what I stand to do if I get the opportunity and also looking forward to seeing that how that can be able to create impact, sustainable impact in your continent, which is Africa. So these were key things I looked out for and tried to channel in into my application for the scholarship. And so just submitting that and getting a response within the next few weeks, asking me for another interview again, showed that was also making the right steps. So with that, I prepared for the interview. So this time around, it wasn't just two people that were interviewing me, there were now three of them. So which means that the heat was getting very intense and then you need to prove to them why they should give you the funding. So I did prepare for the interview, open to whatever question they had and was also happy to let them meet the Emmanuel Uzim that they had actually like requested to see. So it was a very interesting interview. I think that was one of like my best interviews I've ever had. The fact that I was at the, the I think I was, this, I was at the simplest state of myself. I was able to like tell them who I was, also able to like listen to them, ask me questions and carefully like be able to respond to them and tell them more about me and things I've been able to do, especially within the African space. And I think that really was a very good um, high point for them to be able to speak interest in me. But at the same time, I was still not sure if at all I had made it through. So all I just got was, would get back to you. So my whole interview series was a really interesting one from the first onset to the second one is more or less me trying to like, just see how I can put in practical ways of explaining things in essence. So while I try to like go through the whole high level and the like, I still try to bring it down and say, okay, looking at this from this particular stance, this is what it can actually do. If it can affect this certain quantity, then imagine it trickling down or increasing to this certain amount in the nearest future. So when you're able to portray such kind of um, dynamics with your data set and also let them see how realistic this is, even in the, to the most um, layman, I think that shows a lot about yourself. So I wasn't going about those quoting or saying anything, but rather while I had all those, to, those data set to say, I also had realistic things to tie them to. And so that's why we say, try as much as possible to be sincere. So after that, I had another meal, which then said I had actually like gotten the scholarship. And so that is how I won the AFOX um, African Bank, um, Standard Bank Africa's German scholarship in essence. So for the scholarship, the scholarship entails providing nine scholarships to African students in the UK to three different universities. So the, I think Oxford is one of the university. And then you have um, that's, if I'm correct, Legal, uh, London School of Economics and then Cambridge. So these three schools are the schools that are actually being sponsored by AFOC, by AFOX, but not, okay, not AFOX, by the Standard Bank African German Scholarship. And AFOX is the one in charge of those for Oxford. So Oxford, we're only just three of us that actually got into the scholarship. But aside that, AFOX also makes the opportunity to provide more opportunities for African students. So under, although mine is under the Standard Bank, there are other people who got from different scholarships as well. So there's the Ruben Oxford Scholarship, and there's also the MasterCard Scholarship as well. And all these are all under the umbrella of AFOX, which of course opens more opportunities. So for my set, we were 29 of us actually got through the whole scholarship process. And so that shows that there's so much that you can actually like stand to get if you apply to Oxford. So the whole summary of my story is just more like 
first and foremost, understanding your passion and what you really, really want to do. And then seeing how that ties into the college you're applying or the university you're applying. And why you see that, also have a future view of what you stand to do or what you hope to achieve or how you feel that program, that college will help you to achieve that. And while you're doing that, also see that the opportunities available that helps you to gain it. For me, Oxford was a story. So for the other schools I applied, I also had positive feedback when it came to deciding because I knew that, okay, this was the school that actually was doing something very dear to what I wanted, both in the technological space and also bringing it down to, uh, will I say, leadership experience as well. So that was just what also stood out for me. And then seeing that I, the scholarship was there and then I was calling like in one of the best universities in the world. So that was just like all the box ticked for me. And yes, I was able to get into Oxford. So my advice to anyone is whichever the case, whatever course you're studying, if you see that Oxford is the best place for you, please give it a shot. Like Richard Branson would say, don't just forget about it. In his own words, screw it, you just do it. So in essence, if there's anything that you want to really do, just put your mind to it and do it and also give you your best shot. So I'll just stop right here to take quick questions so that I wouldn't take much of your time. So please just so let me know if there are anything or if there's anything I need to say. Thank you very much. It's a quick one. No. So um from our part, I don't know. Please, um I, those are is there any question at uh, this question time, please? So if you have any question, do well to either type your question on the chat box or at least um if you want to speak to him directly, like you can give the opportunity. So uh simple questions that I wish to ask. Okay. Um up. Does anyone have? Please feel free to ask your question. So that's why I had to make it brief so that I can take more questions as much as possible. Hello, Sarah. Good evening. All right. Good evening, Abba. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Um, um, first of all, I'll say a um, big thank you for the quick exposition. And also, I actually admire the way you spoke and the story. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. I'm actually inspiring. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask some few questions about the University of Oxford before you ask about the scholarship. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to know, um, as part of um, the requirements for the Oxford application, I discovered that the uh, written works, written works, you have to provide um, um, your written works that are your own. I don't know if it's applied to your to your to your application during the process of applying for the Oxford admission. And also um, for the standard um, chartered bank stuff, when does the application commences? Or is it alongside your Oxford as you're applying for this that is actually open? Because I believe the, the circle for the September 4th, that's 2023 admission is yet to be closed. Maybe probably late um, January or so. So I want to know how it's been done so that I want to really know whether we're actually in the window of window of this same scholarship that you want you want via your application um, to Oxford, stuff like that. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Abba. I think I'll just quickly answer your question. So the first one had to do with providing, um, will I say, your portfolio of things you've done, maybe research you've worked on. Um, so for my own case, for a start, I wasn't required to provide such. However, it's always, I think they were looking out if you had like a good research experience as well. So for me, I had like some papers which I had worked on, at least two papers, one which is had been published and then one which I did for like my undergrad project. So that I submitted, but I submitted it more or less as I think it was in my CV, so the link was on my CV, and then I'd attached another one as 
a supplementing document, so a supporting document as well, just in case they don't get to see the link I'd put on my CV. But however, if the university or your program requires that you present that, I would advise that you do it. The reason is because, note, like I said earlier on, you are not just the only one applying. Aside you applying from Africa, there are lots of other international students applying from different parts of the world. As I speak to you now, I have a flatmate who finished from MIT and she applied there. And she's studying a course that is pretty much very interesting. So when you see people coming from different schools and deciding to come to study in Oxford, it shows that yes, there's something everyone is looking out for. At the same time, it means that you also stand a very good chance of getting into Oxford. So it's not a deterrent for you to not want to give it a shot, but at the same time, do something that makes you extra from the others. That is what I would just say about it. So if you're meant to submit, do well to submit. If you haven't gotten any, at least try as much as possible that your application appeals to someone who is really passionate about what he or she wants to do or about the course. So maybe you don't have any research paper. I don't know, maybe someone in my um, department or my course actually submitted some um, evidence of research they had done. But at the same time, for my own case, I showed more like, even though I don't have so much academic or research experience, at least I have done something in that, in that light. And also, I'm also willing to do more even when I get into the program because I'm telling them what endears me to the program, why I really wanted to do it. So for me, I was so much passionate about like um, electrifying transport systems. I had worked around electric vehicles as it applies to industries in Nigeria. And so I was looking at it on the last scale, how I can be able to like utilize knowledge around EVs in the Western world and how to then apply to see it proper transitioning in Africa. So telling that story shows that, okay, this young man is really, they need to try to do more research or learn more. So yes, I think you just more or less, you trying to give you your best. So if you have the materials, please put it out there. That is what makes you different from others. At the same time, if you see a passion, yes, say it as much as best you can do it in your essays, in your CV, whichever the case might be, with all materials, you just try to stand out. So that would just be my advice. And then for the second one, which is the scholarship. So the scholarship, like I said, I didn't apply for the Standard Bank prior to my application to Oxford. So I needed to get admitted into Oxford first before then the scholarship came in. So I'd gotten my admission letter from Oxford. So just there waiting on my desk, hot, but then I had no scholarship until after some few weeks, the university sent another email further to my admission and saying, there's this available scholarship. Here is the link to apply for it. This is what it is required. However, I'll go through it and then apply. So I saw the scholarship after I'd gotten the admission. I applied. That was in May. I think I applied in like a month before. So I had my interview in May. And then the scholarship um, um, decision came out in June. So I don't think you're way behind the deadline. I think you are in a good spot now. The deadlines for Oxford, for you to be able to get scholarships from Oxford, you have to be able to submit your application before January 6th. I think that is what the university website says at this point. You might have to go confirm again. But during my own time, it was December 15th. But this year, I think we've extended it to January. So any, so admission, any application submitted after that date wouldn't qualify you for a scholarship. So if you're applying, please do well to try to submit your application before that date. And then I'm sure if you get admitted, of which of course I know you would get admitted, there are opportunities for you to get the scholarships. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, thank you, Zim. You've, um, I've, I've been a personal fan. I've watched lot of, uh, most of the scholarship hack of FON and you have been the coordinator and all that. And so I just want to ask this question. When did your journey start? When did you start applying for scholarship? Was it before you're graduating from the university or after graduating? We say this because we have, um, I think, a kind of a group for undergraduate students. And most of them are usually reluctant. They'll be like, oh, let me wait. After NYSC, I'll start applying. So what is your advice to people like this? Uh, so good question. Thank you. By the way, me, I'm still your fan as well. So this is not to expose <laughs> Well, yeah, um, to undergrads, I think 
my story started in 2019. I think I'll just start with that. So I finished university late 2018. Um, I transitioned to Lagos. I wanted to start my life there. So I applied for a graduate internship pro and I was I started there. But then I started looking towards applying to schools. I applied to some for PhD, but because I didn't really have so much research experience, which is, which is one thing I need to advise undergraduate prior to you leaving school, try to get as much research experience. If you're going for a PhD, go for, get enough sufficient research experience. If at all you don't have that, try to build your profile in a way that appeals to a, a professor that will say, okay, this is somebody that will be very much useful for my research team and the like. So wherever it is, just try as much as possible. Either build your research experience, work in a research lab or work with a professor. You don't literally have to like work, work with the university there about, but if you if you still got your um, project supervisor, try to see how there's any way you can help with that. You can include that in your CV in a very strategic way and say, oh, I had this, ex uh, I had this experience where I was a um, re assistant, research assistant working for my supervisor in so, so, so lab or so, so, so project. It doesn't matter how or when the duration or what it entailed, but as long as you had the experience working with a faculty, it shows that, okay, you can be able to work with any faculty around the world. That's for the undergraduates. Aside that, try to get the experience. So some people go ahead to learn some interesting coding skills, which I would sufficiently advise that you do as well, because it's very much pertinent for anyone who wants to come into the system. So that's the second one. So for my own case, I applied for PhD, but then I felt PhD wasn't really what I wanted to do. I'm not saying this to dissuade anybody from applying to PhD. Please, if you want to do PhD, go for it. I have amazing friends who are doing a PhD and I'm literally so proud of them. But I knew that if I was going to do a PhD, I probably would get frustrated there and you guys would see me with good dreadlocks, whichever the case might be. But then I felt I needed to be very much ready. I needed to understand what my strengths were and then how, which program to apply. So prior to Oxford, I had a scholarship where I studied with the Nigerian University of Technology and Management. So that was also funded by MasterCard, who were the first cohort of which we had just a cut of in the whole of Africa, where they just selected 60 students. So that was like a good start for me. And then I had that program for a year in Nigeria at Lagos. And it was still the same. It, it gave me like a soft landing to get to get an international experience as regards to studies. So I took that heads on. And after finishing with that, I think that was what gave me the confidence to decide to apply for such an Ivy school as Oxford. So please, the earlier, the better you can do it to apply. But even if you're out of school and you've been out for a year or two, please don't feel um, down or don't feel lost that oh, it's too late for you. I was on that same note. I had friends who finished 2018, they got admitted 2018. Some got admitted 2019. I got admitted 2021. Is it? No, 2022, sorry. I got admitted 2022. And so it's, we're talking about three to four years waiting for admission. But here I am. The wait was really worth it because now I'm in one of the best universities or perhaps the best university in the world. So who knows? So feel free to give you a shot. So yeah, that would be just my advice. It's never too late when it's your time. I'm sure it will come out as unique and special that, that you can never imagine. So yeah. Thank you. That is about uh, that's a very good inspirational message. Please, we have two questions on the chat. I don't know if you can see them. All right. Okay. Um, let me try to look at it. Um, so the first one from Okay, so thanks for the seminar. I'm really happy to be part of it. My question is, what's the process for obtaining the scholarship? I kind of joined late. Um, so yes, I earlier mentioned, just in case you didn't get to know, um, so it depends. So scholarships in Oxford are in different categories. So it's always good to like check to see what exactly your program requires. So for mine, there were scholarships that you could get if, you had some certain, um, will I say, qualifications for it. So some were only unique to UK students, just like you know, for most UK universities, they only allow it for EU students or EU citizens. 
Some were open to international candidates, although maybe not for Africans. Others were open for solely women. So if you're a, if you're a woman and perhaps you're also from Africa or you're interested in the tech space, you have the scholarship. So it just means whichever one you qualify for. Some are more like leadership programs that you need to join, which also offers admission. So if you have like a good leadership um, experience or prior experience before Oxford, they might see, oh, this is someone that we can actually like pick and try to like build up and try to put him into that category of where we have world leaders and the like. So yes, there are different ones. So for me, I think Wedenfield Hoffman was one that stood out for me with regards to his leadership program. And then I applied. I didn't really see other ones. If they were, maybe I missed them by one chance or the other. But it's always good to carry out in-depth research about it. For the one I had actually gotten, wasn't essentially put out there in my course that you could actually qualify for it. But however, I think in one way or the other, the school saw it fitting that, okay, even if you didn't notice, we can actually bring it to you. So that's where the second part comes. So it's either you identify the scholarship first, check if you're required to submit application before you are submit to Oxford, or if you, you are meant to submit after you've gotten admitted into Oxford. So for my own scholarship, it was after I'd gotten admitted into Oxford, and then Oxford recommends to you. For other people who I know, they didn't really need to even apply for any scholarship. All they just did was they applied to Oxford, their application stood out. Oxford said that, oh, this is a very unique candidate. We can't afford to lose this person. We have this money. Let's sponsor this chap. So it all depends on you, first of all, doing your research, knowing the course you're doing, and knowing if the course actually offers funding, even aside that, also indicating in your application that, yes, you would want funding. And then while you're also doing that, look for applications that or scholarships that require you to submit applications. If you see those ones, apply for them, bump in the applications. However, just have your fingers crossed that if you get admitted into Oxford at the tail end, there is a 90% or thereabout chance that you would get a scholarship opportunity. It all depends whether you need to now submit another application or if you just did just select and say, well, you actually qualify for it. So yeah, that's just it for, it, for that particular question. Now, the second question is, what are the courses in focus? Um, this question seems a little ambiguous, so I wouldn't really know how you're coming in. But however, Oxford is, uh, let's say, a very much research deep university. Um, some would say that they are into sciences. So we, because of Oxford has this um, arts background when it started and the like, so there's more of um, literature kind of um, programs in that essence, art related programs. But at the same time, it's science um, research is also one of the top in the world. And so there are courses that you can actually apply. Now, something unique about Oxford courses is that if you're looking for a course that is saying electrical engineering, you might not find it. If you're looking for a course that is saying probably like medicine, you might not literally find it quoted in that word. So some of these courses are very interdisciplinary that it just applies to key um, intertwined subjects or courses. So for mine, I'm doing the energy systems. For other schools I've been applying and I'm seeing, oh, electrical engineering. Okay, so masters, yeah, masters in civil engineering. You would probably not see a very out outrightly puts masters in civil engineering, where you could see maybe a master's in structural engineering or maybe a master's in wind offshore engineering in brackets, civil and the like. So entirely what it just means is if you have this background, because they will also tell you what the prerequisites are. So you must have a, a, a background in civil engineering and the like. So always look out for all those requirements. Those are what makes it. For me, I applied for energy systems. There was no course that said electrical engineering, masters in electrical engineering in Oxford, but there was the masters in energy systems as well as other engineering that had electrical engineering as a requirement. And I just felt, okay, this was the course I needed to apply to. So that's just one thing you should look out for in essence. Well, yeah, 
if you're looking for courses, then you might not see them. Another thing here, the Oxford is open to masters. So they have like master's courses and also you have like your DPhil. So DPhil is the similar example of a PhD in the US. So it's called DPhil here. So if you, your DPhil is for like three to four years, if you're applying for a DPhil directly, which you could get, and then for the masters, masters run within a space of either one year or two years. I'm on the one year master's degree. There are some that actually run for two years. The ones that run for two years are called the MPhil because the whole idea is you spend the first year doing a taught um, degree or a taught class, and then the second year is spent in research. So for the, I think I've basically been talking more about the masters. For the PhD, you can actually apply for a DPhil directly to Oxford, and then you can get funding from your department, from your college, or even from your faculty that wants to take you in. So there's also that opportunity as well. So yes, thank you. Um, you said one challenge I'm having recently is applying for a graduate degree in different background. I do have experience in other than my undergrads. Mm. So my advice I always tell people is try as much as possible to see the flexibility that your course can give to you and how it then applies to what you want to do. So there's no, there's no gain saying that you won't find the course you want to do in Oxford, no. If I say you won't find it, I'm totally lying. You would find the course, but ideally, I think what you should look out for is what exactly do I want to do? Is there like a particular research I want to go into? Or is there like a broader field that is covered within this my studies? So if you are a computer scientist or a computer engineer, then there might be like a broader scale where you might not just be doing computer science in Oxford, but you might be doing computer science that applies to health. Or you might be doing computer science that applies to um, finance or whichever the case might be. So I know there's someone who is studying digital health and in that sense, he's just trying to see how the health sector can be able to transition and try to um, acclimatize with the whole digital trends that are going on. So in sense, what I'll just say is try to see it on a broader picture. Don't just streamline your, um, your graduate program in Oxford to just one thing, but try to see how it actually relates. One of the beauty about Oxford is that Oxford tries to see how you can be able to like interconnect different knowledge together. So the fact that I have an electrical background, I'm currently doing courses that relate to businesses. I'm taking courses that actually has to do with thermodynamics, even chemical engineering and the likes. The whole idea is when you find yourself out there in the world, you're not just to just you're not going to put your head in just one space. If you need to be like someone who has a good understanding of things, then you need to learn them from the basic. But I don't need to know it entirely, but at least have like one or two nuggets about this so that when you find yourself in such scenarios, you will be a world changer. You'll be a world champion that can be able to say, yes, despite the fact that this is who I am or this is my core profession or my experience, but at least I still have something that I can be able to come out and say one or two things about. So for someone who is doing an engineering in Oxford, Everyone that applies for undergraduate engineering in Oxford does all the engineering programs. So if you're applying to Oxford, you're not just applying to electrical engineering or mechanical or civil, you're applying to engineering. So your 100 level, 200 level, 300 level, you're going to do all the engineering courses. I think it's then in your 300 level, you might not get to specialize in the one you want to do. So I think that should give you like an understanding. But like I was saying, Look at it from the broader part. Don't try to streamline yourself because there's so much. The world is becoming so disruptive that things are changing. And I think we need to flow with how things are now. So see yourself as, this is what I'm doing. In what particular group do I think I'll be able to find myself, be able to apply myself in, and then go for it. So as long as this, you have that passion for it, you're trusting that you're going to find that course in Oxford, well, at the same time, you could still find the course you really want if it's also streamlined to a particular field. So yes. Um, Guado said, I graduated with civil engineering, but currently practicing energy and electrical engineering. Beautiful. I think that might be like my own case study as well. So I, I wouldn't say I finished from civil engineering. I had electrical engineering background, but at the same time, because so electrical engineering, engineering well, 
entirely, I've put my whole focus in the energy space. So electrical engineering is so broad that you can find your service, either you are in the communications part or you're in the um, building electronics side of it, or perhaps you're in the electrical part, which is the energy. So I found myself in the energy space. And then when I was applying for my course, I wasn't, I looked out to see if I was seeing any electrical engineering, but I couldn't find anything. So the closest I came into was energy. And when I saw energy, I was looking out for renewable energy. But also I was saying that, come, we're not doing renewable energy. If you're coming to do energy in Oxford, you're going to learn the holistic part of energy so that when you now understand the holistic part, you won't have any bias, but rather be able to see how you can be able to solve energy problem on a holistic level. So if you've learned from the whole energy program and then you feel like renewable energy is the solution and we should throw away any other energy, fine, no problem, go for it. The whole idea is that we're giving you everything so that you can be able to be able to, you can be able to make induced um, knowledge and intuition of whatever you've learned. And if you feel like the other sources are also relevant, then try to see how is it possible that we can sustainable transition from this energy without really affecting energy demands and also causing catastrophe in the society just because we want to switch from one energy to the other. So that's what makes Oxford very unique. It sees it in the practical side and says, yes, there's a whole lot going on. But at the same time, we need to look at it around the box. There might be a rebound effect. How do you come in? as a professional to be able to tackle this problem and not just tackle it from one side but see it from both ends. So yeah, that's just it. So if whatever you're doing, please feel free to do that. Yeah, I'm glad that answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Zim. <laughs> you know, this our John is becoming more intense. So we compile some questions okay. and then we'll be glad to answer them. Uh, for the first, Please, what does the scholarship cover? Does it cover your monthly stipend, your accommodation, and then for the married scholars? Let's say, for instance, those that are taking the Japa level, so the Japa mm. dreams are another level. So let me say you get married. So does the scholarship cover for your future children, like your children's children, and your wife or your husband? Okay, um, let me see. Please give me a minute. Let me just quickly quit something. All Take right. Yeah, I had a call coming in. Um, so with regards to that, very interesting question. So scholarship covers everything. Um, so it covers my accommodation, it covers my feeding, and necessarily my living expenses. So I think there's no cause for alarm when it comes to that very aspect. Um, for those who have partners, um, yes, you also have the opportunity to bring in your partners. I wouldn't want to mention or quote names, but I know I have colleagues who actually like came with their family to Oxford as well. So Oxford provides the environment that you can be able to relocate with your family and there are always accommodation as well provided by the university that you can actually be able to like book down and have with your family coming around. So here's such opportunities there. For the funding, the funding, so my knowledge is sufficient enough to cater for you throughout your study period. So that is a practical example. The UK Research and Innovation Institute actually has a stipulated minimum um, scholarship or stipend that students are meant to require. And just this year, 2nd of September, it was increased by over 1,500 pounds. So essentially, yes, you're good to go. And also wouldn't want to put you on the side where you shoot yourself in the leg. So yes, you would be comfortable. You're not going to be living an extravagant life. Please note that. But at the same time, with what you provided, you should be able to keep you. So yeah, that would just be the answer to that. OK, so there is this video I, I listened to about um, Death Snow Gidding Bay. He's a very popular person. He got a scholarship into Harvard. So he said he got into Oxford too. But the difference in the application process is that Oxford is more into book, book, book. They want to mm. know if you are a first class graduate. They want to yes. know if you have done this, if you're not done this research. So how about for like Dolo those, if I should use Nigerian word, <laughs> those with the two one or two two, what is their fate? Is that we should just leave at Oxford for the first class people like you? What's mm. the advice to us? Okay, um, for a start, I, I, I think I probably might want to counter that a little. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> Every, every university is looking for 
the best candidates. That one is for sure. So everyone, and secondly, everyone is a great candidate as well. So however, I think universities, what they try to do is, or perhaps Oxford, I'll use for example, is also tries to see how they can be able to simulate a situation where you find yourself in the program, but then you don't get overwhelmed in the program because of your academic strength. So they try to say, so I wouldn't say all programs require first class, no. So there are different programs. As I say, always do well to do your research and find out the requirements. So for different set of programs, there are requirements. So you do not need to have a first class if you're going to be applying to Oxford for some particular courses. So do well to do your research and find out. And like I said, we don't, it's, just, it's not all about academic um, proficiency, but also, the passion is one thing that comes in. So your story says a lot. Also your experience as well. If you're going into a PhD, you want to do an MPhil, are there researches you've been able to work in? There are some people who do not, who didn't finish with the first class, but they have like a sessional research experience. Like they've been able to like break things down and recommend things on the academic scope of things globally. So well, why, why say no to such kind of person? So Oxford also would give you the opportunity if you stand out in that nature. And then there are other people who have practically been able to like do great impact in their environment, in their society in one way or the other, who necessarily didn't have a first class as well. But the impact they've done, when you compare to a first class candidate, it's glaring that you should choose this candidate over a first class because this person looks like someone who has a zeal, a passion, the grit to be able to achieve things. So in that regard, I would say, everyone is welcome to apply to Oxford, literally. I finished with the first class. Maybe if I had finished with the second class, I would have still got into Oxford. I don't know. The same Harvard we're looking into at the same time. Harvard is looking out for first class students. So there's no way you say, there are some schools that say no, or are having their bias to first class. I think it just um, trickles down to the course you're going for. So if you're going for one, a very competitive course, that, you know the applicants are really really very um intense and the application also it's a lot of numbers so when you when you check through this course you see um we 2000 people applied only 200 were selected or 1000 applied only 20 were selected you should know how competitive it is so it means that you have to like put in your energy but if you see courses that also, that also show you that oh Maybe 100 people applied and 80 were selected. It shows there's a high acceptance rate. So it just all depends on you as an applicant. Do not be deterred by any first class or whichever the case is. Everyone is unique. Everyone is best. It just depends on how you tell your story. I, can I, I feel like at this point, I could still finish with the second class and still be able to tell my story and that will make anyone engaged to having me on their team. So yes. Thank you for answering the question. So we all had him. You can go ahead and start applying for Oxford. The dream, please. Okay. So my next question is: What um, what's the situation with um, students that want to work? Like, you know, you're under scholarship years, or you still do stars of work just to make money to send to your family relative. This is Christmas, so you know what I mean. I understand. Um. So. Hmm. <laughs> Let me tell you the truth and nothing but the truth. So um, I, my, I'm literally like depending on my stipend that I'm getting from the scholarship and I'm actually doing fine. I'm okay. I, I've not added weight yet, but maybe it's distress. But entirely, Oxford would advise you and I would not just advise, but the university requires that if you're in the university, you should essentially like giving your full um, all into your studies. So it doesn't give you the opportunity to try to work or say you want to go look for another extra job to do. Unlike other universities in the UK where you have extra time to be able to like do some jobs and the like, so you wouldn't give that. So, but because of that kind of circumstances that is put before you, in fact, it's not like us, but we even tell you. You yourself, when you get, when you come in and you, you get to experience the whole classes and you have assignments to do and then you have research, one thing or the other, it's going to be so overwhelming that you would probably have time to even say you want to tackle any other thing else. 
So my advice would be just focus on your studies. Oxford in its own uniqueness allows that if you need extra funding or if you need extra support, you can always reach out to your school. So there are different tiers to which you can actually like request for funds. So you can request from your college. So Oxford has like 50 or an average colleges and every student has to belong to a college at least. So if you can actually like submit a request telling them that, oh, I have this challenge and you might, I need extra funding. And the college is always happy to support you because they know that, yes, it could really get intensive at some point that you might need extra support. Aside that, you can also be able to apply to your department or your program, asking them for support as well. So if you need maybe support with academic things and the likes, with respect to finances, you're also happy to support them, apply to them, and they'll be happy to support because they know that, yes, they don't want their students to be under pressure. And even if that is not available for you, you can still go on the highest level and apply to the university as a whole. And the university finance and bursary department is, are also happy to support in essence. But on the basic need, as long as you're not extravagant, what the stipend you get on a yearly basis or probably on a monthly or quarterly basis should be enough if you do your proper budgeting. So like I said, I've been in Oxford for like three months now and I am doing fine and I'm okay. All I just try to do is I try to cut down excessive costs and the likes, try to make sure that I can finish my program in one year so that when I finish and I finish with a good result, uh -huh, then the job that we follow up should be able to cover up all those stress that I worked myself out. And then if you want me to send anything for Christmas, New Year, for, for the entire year, that is okay. But at this point, the main concern is you're in school, get that good result. This is Oxford. You shouldn't just settle for less, but rather get a very good result. Get that dream job or whichever the case might be. Do your research. Some of these opportunities also come with extra funding as well. So sometimes you might even have all the funding coming your way. It all depends on how exceptional you might be while you're studying. Yes, that's the need for anybody that wants to come and work. You can still, if you want to work, you can work, but don't quote <laughs> me that say you should go and work. So you come no, to not okay. so, yeah, that's so, um, during your application process, is there anything that made your application to stand out? Like, we just want to get some insider information. So, for those of us that want to apply probably this year or next year, we'll not send mm -hmm. out essays, uh, personal statements, so no, just generally application process. What made you stand out? Why were you chosen for the program? Uh, so I wish I could refer you to my course director. I have no <laughs> idea. And uh, I think if there's anything, it's God. But however, just so that we'd be very much um, practical around it. So I'll just mention three things and then try to build on this, the school of thought. So the first one is um, professionalism. So. I tried to ensure that I was very professional in whatever I was doing with respect to my application. So I wasn't trying to do something very shabby, but rather I needed to see the reason why I was doing it. So I had to put in all, connect all the dots together, make sure that everything stood out clear that yes, this is somebody who has a good or a very clear plan and knows how he wants to go about it. And then try to tie it to whatever I was doing. The second thing is excellence. Now I learned excellence from people who are like my mentors and also friends. So excellence makes you stand out from other people. So when other people do to a certain extent and say, oh, this is fine by me. When you put in excellence, it gives you that extra push, that extra, um, let's say levy that you can use to hold whoever it is that is looking at you. So for me, I try to see how best it is that I can put in excellence. What makes me stand out in essence? How has excellence been something that has guided me throughout my life as a person, as an African, and also as an engineer? And then how that also like will translate to me being in Oxford and achieving such excellence. And then the last one is sincerity. So of all my applications, I think I felt at peace applying to Oxford because I saw it as this was just the course I needed. And because I, I saw the course and the course chose me, I decided to be very sincere and tell myself, just tell them who you really are. 
don't don't go and be talking cock and bull stories. Just tell them this is who you are. Tell them what it is that has actually like been motivating you. Tell them how you've gone through the whole stress of trying to achieve something what you're able to achieve from it, how we made impact and how you're so proud of it and how you want to like be able to channel it for something greater. Just be sincere about it. And so that was just it. So putting all of this in together, so professionalism, I try to like tailor it to meet a certain Oxford um, scenario of that, of is requirement to so try to see that okay you've given me some very succinct questions for me to respond to so i try as much as possible to respond to the questions directly so if they're asking me that she give them a statement of purpose i should not go and start writing another perhaps personal statement or research statement or whatever but just more or less understand what the prompt is find out what exactly their requirement is say 500 words make sure you stick to your 500 words limit and don't try to Go around trying to prove that oh you're smart and you want to do a thousand words. Maybe it's my workout. I know somebody who got into Harvard and all he just had to say they say is Black Lives Matter with just three words, and he got into Harvard. Some people must have probably like written a thousand and one essays or words in their essay, and they didn't get into it. But they chose that young man because he just wrote Black Lives Matter, and that was just someone who was very much strategic and also very much simple. So that's for professionalism. Ex um, excellence is as much as possible doing things that makes you stand out. So for me, I try as much as possible to structure my essay in a way that when you read through it, you can be able to like tell about me even without even asking me to talk about myself. You could actually like see me in my essay ideally. So I try to tell what I had done for my undergraduates, had what projects I had worked on and how it actually like rallies around the energy space. So even as for undergrad, when I didn't even have any idea of that I wanted to be in the energy space, but something I did, how I wanted it to like trickle. So mine was more like, I was, I did power system engineering and then I wanted to see how possible it is I could be able to help in ratifying issues with regards to our um, challenging energy system in, Af in Nigeria. So I looked into creating a hybrid system, hybrid renewable energy system, and trying as much as possible to see how to optimize it, such that it can be able to mitigate both challenges of you not know, having electricity or energy supply both during the day and at the night. So it was a very, very simple project, very intense one as well. But the whole idea is that I looked at the possibility of providing this technology, also optimizing it to be able to meet rural demands. I wasn't doing it because I wanted to do it for the large scale or thinking, oh, I wanted to do a project that everybody would be so bewildered around. But I just wanted to say, there was a problem I've noticed in rural communities, they don't have electricity. How about we can be able to like provide something as disintegrated as this and anybody can be able to afford it and then optimize it to meet their needs. So that was what my undergraduate project. And then now, so, okay, since I've done this project, now I want to switch into a career life. I want to go into automation so where I can be able to automate the system. So maybe the person that is in Nepal office is always on and off in the switch every time. Maybe that's what we're having light. Perhaps I can automate it such that the person does not need to stress themselves. Let the switch just be on forever. And if there's a fault, the thing can trip off. Just to understand how it is I can be able to like optimize it on the general scale. So I went to go and do something relating to automation. And so I worked in that space. After like getting one or two experiences, learning, doing the whole coding and the likes, not so much serious coding though. But yeah, getting that intuitive knowledge around here, I was like, okay, now I've done this. There's this trend around IoT and then trying to see how you can be able to create smart systems. And so, okay, maybe I might not be able to do IoT for small things, but there's the industrial IoT, which is the IIoT 4.0. And this will require having a knowledge in machine learning data analytics it's like why not just go and get more information and then try and see how you can attach this to what you meant with automation and renewable energy and so i decided to apply and that's how i got into NET. got all the useful knowledge i needed to get around machine learning i didn't have to go so in depth but at least i was able to get the things i really needed i felt like these are practical things i can actually like implement and do something more sustainable and then even aside that i was also working on a 
different projects that required me trying to see how is it that we can convert waste plastics into like additive in, uh, engineering um, products at the end of the day. So giving plastics a second life cycle. And we do, so the whole idea was trying to convert plastics into 3D printing materials that you can use for um, innovations around schools. So primary school, secondary school, even universities can use this for researchers and the like. So that I was also working on the side. So with all of this, now I'm bringing it back. I was like, okay, I've gotten all of this. What can I be able to use this knowledge I have to do something that is very much unique and strategic and that can actually make huge impact in my very little niche. So then I saw the opportunity to try to work with um, electric vehicles. So in the renewable space, there was a lot going in the renewable space. People are going into solar systems, providing, I was like, ah, if I go in, I might be just one out of the thousands of people that are into this. So nobody will notice me, nobody will see me. So but there was this one that came in, I was like, oh, I want to start bringing in electric vehicles in the name of electric forklifts into Nigeria. And we need to try to see how we can automate them and make them that we can easily be able to monitor them with our phones. I was like, I'm the guy, take me. And even though I had no experience, but it was more like I was willing to go into this new space, learn more about it, build something new out of it, and then try to see how it to impact. And so that was just my story. So I joined this company, became, joined, became one of their senior members in the team, even at a young age help to try to see how we could create sustainable transitioning for EVs in industries. And then saw the company grow from very minute, from just maybe few machines to hundreds of machines in just less than a year. So with that, I would like, there was just so much huge impact that I could see that being part of the first people in the market to do something like this and then be able to make such kind of huge growth in this line, and not just in the whole, environmental energy space, also in the social economic part of the economy as well. So people, imagine number of people that get jobs just from that. Imagine how you're able to like improve the well-being of people. Imagine the fact that you're able to provide jobs, not just for men only, but you're also like encouraging gender equality as well by providing jobs for women. So all of this just brought up a new opportunity. I was like, if you connect the dots from undergraduates to what it is that we're able to like do, and we don't see it as a success, and so because we feel like success is when you keep building on it, and so what we're able to like do in that little time that we could say yes, we are happy that we are able to make the environment smile. We are happy that we can be able to make our customers smile, and also at the same time make people smile as well. So that was just enough justification for me to say, okay, it's time to take it on a more global way or an international level. So also was just the right thing. So Nigeria probably has ticked the box for me. Maybe there's a way I could learn on international level and see how it can trickle it down to Africa. So that was just like a summary of my story. But then if you see, it was more like trying to write the story in five words, I mean, 500 words, and then trying to see how Oxford will help me to be able to achieve this. Maybe on my own and part of, with respect to the fact that I was able to have people who were there to support me, I've been able to achieve this very little thing. But at the same time, I believe that the Oxford experience will help me to be able to like even achieve far greater and still be able to give back to my society, both in Oxford and also in Africa as well. So I think your essay should just rely around that. And so that will summarize it for the part of sincerity, telling your story, what is it that you've done? How has it really made impact? How then do you want to like translate it to the future? And then how would Oxford experience help you do that? And you're good to go. Thank you for your sincerity. Okay, so after you believe so much, are you allowed to speak back? Or oh, is scholarship all the same with the Commonwealth scholarship? You heard like once you have done, like you literally want to shift your back to your country. So do people have the opportunity to stay back and have you get a job or so implement what they have studied, or is it like a must that you can go back to your country once you are there? If you want to go back to your country, you can go back home, but <laughs> scholarship doesn't require you to go back to your country. You are not mandated to go back to your country for at all. The whole idea is it instills in you that um, that's knowledge, that's 
that passion to want to see that you want to create something. So aside the fact that I got the scholarship, I also have some series of uh, mentorship programs go through as well. So we have series where we get to listen to academics, faculties, African leaders come to speak to us. And then when you hear these people speak to you, you get to see that engineering nature to why you should be part of the African dream and see how you can channel everything you're seeing here into doing something. So I have a lot of my colleagues who are so much in there to coming back to Nigeria, including me, to come and do one thing or the other there. So, but the scholarship does not mandate you. So it's not Commonwealth, it's not Chevening that you have to come to Africa and spend like two years of your character. No, you can actually stay back and get a job. At the same time, it's also open for you to do whatever you're doing, try to see how it actually impacts in Africa. And I think there's something new that is going to be coming. I'm not, I don't know if I was, if it's the right time to say it, but at least for my scholarship, there's a high chance that after you're done, you can actually like have the opportunity to work with a company in Africa as perhaps more like um, an opportunity, yeah, more or less like that kind of opportunity. I think if you check the website, you get to see, know more about it. And so yes, there's that opportunity there, even with jobs, there's this certainty that you're going to get a job even from just being a part of the AFOX scholarship. So yes. Thank you. You're welcome. So everyone, I know we are more excited about the scholarship. I mean, everybody wants to remember about much I've done studies. So <laughs> also what seems to be the best fit. My next question is that can you apply to more than one scholarship? Your story was that you got an admission into Oxford and then the provisions for you to apply to scholarships. Can you apply to more than one? So in case you don't get E and get B or C or D. Yeah, so um Mine was, I applied to, if I think about it now, I applied to two scholarships, one before I got admitted, the second one after I got admitted. But yes, I was able to clinch one scholarship. So yes, you can apply to more than one scholarships. Okay, so what's your transition in life from Nigeria to UK, visa application, the scholarship by the diploma for the etiquette, visa, the international passport, how was it like? My dear, so I never even take up classes so that will talk. So yeah, um a scholarship actually like catered for everything. So like I said, it's an all-round scholarship. And so I my flight was taken care of by this university, my visa, entirely everything was paid off by the university. So I had no issues like with regards to transitioning from Nigeria to the UK. Um, I think even the basic things that was, was there, just the same thing everybody will go through is the whole trying to get ready for the international experience. So trying to make sure you've reached out to everybody and tell them, I'm going, don't miss me too much. I'll be back. Love you all and the likes. I'm making sure that you get to reach out to as much as people as you can so that it doesn't look like you've forgotten them. And then also trying to make sure you have everything prepared for it for those that are actually like working trying to see how you can be able to like will i say carefully be able to like transition from your job so if your job will allow you to still stay on a hotel you you can actually come back after you're done which is also fine but yeah for those who are in their career space some of them have to quit their jobs it wasn't easy quitting especially after you built, built so much relationship and you've been growing in the company so yeah, so that was just it for me. But entirely, it was really an interesting experience because I had people who were there to support me. So like I always say, uh, wherever you are, try as much as people to connect with people who are who have gotten such an experience before outside, or even those who are even in Nigeria that could also support as well. So just have the supporting people around. And yes, you will definitely have fun. So for me, everything was covered. I had a very amazing flight. In fact, I didn't even know that my flight was a first class ticket. I thought that I was supposed to be it. They told me, they were like, oh, sir, go to the lounge. I thought I did not hear them well. I just carried the box. I was like, why are these people treating me special? I went and was still with economy. So they turned they're like, excuse me, sir, I'm not supposed to be there. I was like, ah, no, I cannot do this. I went. My dear, I enjoyed myself right from the airport. They were giving me free food, wine, wine. Before I know I enter flight, they were still giving me. I was like, okay, so this is what that means. I don't want to sit in the economy. 
So yeah, yeah. the scholarship <laughs> is like a king and a queen wherever you find yourself. And yes, it covers everything, including your health as well. That reminds me. So your health surcharge is also paid by the scholarship. So you don't have to pay for your health surcharge, which is close to like 800 to 900 pounds. So yeah. Like your key moment, then the provisions for no like the weather and stuff like that. What are the major lights? Do you find very interesting about the provisions that offer to the Yeah, so I think the first thing will be the community of people I, I find I get to be with in Oxford. So I I get to like I, I think my friends are one set of people I cherish very much, and I'm grateful to Oxford for giving me the opportunity, both those from Africa and also those from other diversity around the world. So that is one unique experience I cannot treat for anything. At least, don't worry, I'll start speaking for them. Maybe for now, I'm still trying to like take the Nigeria thing. I'll, I'll change my tone. But at the same time, um, part of it, maybe culture shock came into place as well. So despite the fact that some of us have witnessed Lagos life or witnessed Abuja life or there about sense of professional experience. But at the same time, when I got here, it was a whole different ball game. So getting to be able to speak and make sure people understand me, of which wasn't really much of a challenge. And then the food was one problem. Thank God, thank God, I, I brought my ghost. Anyway, that's just fun. <laughs> So yeah, um, so food, I think for me, I was open. I'm very much, I'm someone who loves trying out new things. So I'm open to different cultural um, things and themes. Uh, food wasn't much of a challenge for me. For those that which I felt like I didn't really like, I stayed away from it, but then I still have like some of the basic things. Don't worry, there's Indomie here. In case you're worried, you see Indomie. there's Indomie here. And there are things you actually like. So the whole idea is just, and yeah, there's also like an African store as well. So you can just go to where the most of the African or Pakistani stores are, the Arab stores, and you can be able to get things that you really love at, at home. I have a friend who said that she has prepared pepper soup. That if you, need, you don't need to have pepper soup, if that there's a particular leaf, the bay leaf, you don't have leaf. What's in the name? So yeah, I told her to send me her. Um, uh, cooking, whatever. Let me try it out as well. So maybe one day I'll prepare a cut so I share to everybody everywhere. So, but yeah, food was another culture shock. And then the fact that I'm able to speak to you guys with this shirt on, it shows that I'm Superman because they could. Ah, the code is on a different level. So, yeah, I think it hasn't started snowing yet in Oxford, but the temperature has lately had been a minus two. I heard this is kind of like the coldest so far in a long time. At this time last year, it wasn't as cold as this, but there's a high uh, prospect that there might be snow this year. So me, I'm looking forward to the snow. If it was not for me and Oxford will fight. So, but at the same time, it's very, very cold as well. But yes, Oxford is a very like community-like school where you can easily walk. So it's not like a whole far distance thing. So people enjoy walking around so you can literally walk, keep yourself warm, and also they are still interconnecting buses, which was something I easily got used to. Um, uh, I think for me, I wanted to try out something very exciting. So I decided to take in cycling. So after my first two weeks in Oxford, I got myself a bike. So I have my own car, my bike car. So I, 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 I'm proud of it. So I cycle some days to class just for the experience of just keeping feet and enjoy the process. Oxford is a cycling city, so you don't worry, you will not feel any different. It's not like somebody will carry bands and pass you. you don't worry. Just transport as well to show that you can also cycle fast. If I want to even buy another bicycle that is finer than the one I have, just to show off. But yeah, it's just an amazing place to be. And then opportunities where you get to attend different events. So for those of you who are very much um, what's done with Harry Potter feeling? You know, Harry Potter was acted in Oxford Christ College precisely. So that's kind of feeling you get in almost most of the colleges in Oxford as well. That dinner feeling where you just sit and always you have dinners together and it's just so heavenly. So having that 
once in a week, twice in a week is very unique. Sometimes you go to attend to balls, like really formal balls and the likes. And then there are some other events and conferences that you could actually attend as well, which are very unique. And you get to network with people that are instrumental to your growth as well. For me, I can't remember how much network I've been able to make in this, this short period I've been here, reaching out to faculty, reaching out to colleagues, even people who have graduated, even people in the industry that come around to talk, I try as much as possible to keep in contact with them. So Oxford made me to meet unique people. Some of them you see in my profile. Maybe if you go out in another school, I won't have met them. People will be coming around. I snap be with them. That one has an archive. The other people I've met, so yeah, it's very like very fun, a place where you can you have so much opportunities to do a lot of things. So please make good use of it in case you come around. And at the same time, plan as well. So don't try to attend everything. There are some things that have priority. So for me, I try to see that it's not everything I go for. Before I will go for all the events, I'm very sorry if you see me, I'll turn to MC. No, I try as much as possible to choose the kind of events I go for and events that will be very much resourceful to me. If it's not very important and I have assignments to do, then assignments takes the priority over any other thing else. So yeah, that's just basically my takeaway from the opportunity and scholarship at Oxford. Thank you very much. So oh. like just last question, how many essays did you write? So just ask it again, how many of them was just the two? Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm asking this is that so if I have any email from my community that probably would love you to review that essay, yeah, okay, I'll talk to you. Be clear. <laughs> All right. Um, so when I applied, there was just one major essay, which was the uh, statement of information. Yeah. So um, that was just the only one, which was 500 words. Every other thing, there was maybe like short answers that you have to respond to them. For the, uh, for the scholarship, I think I had another essay but not, not entirely an essay it was more like a form that you had to fill for each of the responses required an average of 200 to 300 words so three essays if or three prompts that you're, you're meant to answer so for each prompt you, i think you provide a maximum of 300 to 350 words so that's that ideally like the application process that I went through. But some might require you to submit maybe more than one essay, whichever the case might be. But whichever the case is, I'm always happy to help review any essay. If at all there's a need for me to also like recommend someone to help review your essay, I'll be happy to do that. Maybe I might not be I might not be the best person to review your essays with respect to my experience and my field. I could happily like talk to friends who I know would readily be open to help with that. So that is okay. So please you guys feel free to reach out and I'm happy to help. Thank you very much. So I think we shall be off for now. Thank you for your time, for the insight. I'm not the more excited to apply to Oxford. Hopefully, we get to see. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> thank you. So, this is a um, FOA. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by Flourish Opportunities Network. Please don't forget to subscribe, comment, like, and share with your friends and families. We are just as excited to have more webinars with different scholars. And the goal is to Japa. Don't Japa. Speaking is the meaning. So, um, we hope you get all the opportunities that you want. And feel free to consume as many videos as you wish on our YouTube channel. The link is being and is emitted on the group chat. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Emmanuel. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Marie. Really appreciate it. And to everyone who made our time to join, I also appreciate it as well. I wish you all the best and keep being excellent. Thank you. Bye.